Thank you, Antoine. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to meet you today. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present part of my research. Uh, before to begin, I will uh, present myself in a few words. So I am Olivier Alain. I am Associate Professor at University Paris, Paris Cité, ex Paris Descartes. So the, 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 the brother of uh, Paris Diderot. And I do my research at uh, the Center of uh, the Economy de la Sorbonne, which depends on University Paris 1. Uh, I uh, conduct all my research in post keynesian economics. Uh, and I have uh, put here the main topics uh, I am think, thinking about. Uh, first, I work on my microeconomic basis, uh, consistent with post Keynesian economics, of course, M microeconomic basis of the principle of effective demand. I also work on functional dis income distribution and economic activity. Uh, most of my research uh, concerns uh, demand led economic growth in the long run. And it is what I am going to speak this evening. And I also work on supply constraints in demand-led models. So I am going to present you a paper, an article uh, entitled uh, Super Multiplayer Model with Two Non-Capacity Generating Semi-Autonomous Demand Components. Uh, which has been published uh, a few months ago in stru Structural Change and Economic Dynamics. And uh, the main uh, issue of the paper is to um, think about the long-run properties of uh, economic growth in a model where growth is Driven, driven by demand. So as you probably know, there are a lot of post-Keynesian research on this kind of issue. And I, I remind uh, the authors of the best handbooks on the topics, huh? Eckhart Heine and Marc Lavoie, uh, who you know, of course. And there are a lot of competing models to understand long run uh, economic growth. And I just uh, give a, a, a short list uh, Cambridgean models, Kaleskian models, Haroldian models, Calderian models, and super multiplayer models. And today, my speech will be, will put the focus on Kaleskian models and super multiplayer models. So you, you have to know that uh, still today, th there, is, uh, there are lively debates about the driving forces uh, of aggregate demand in the long run. And there are, there are lively debates among post-Keynesian economists. So, this is a summary of my presentation. Uh, as I know that most of you are not totally customized with this kind of uh, topics, I try to propose a pedagogical presentation. So I will begin by a quick review of the principle of effective demand and neo calescan growth models. Then I will provide the basics of super multiplayer models. Uh, in the third uh, section, I will try to answer the question, can non-capacity generating demand com components be autonomous in the long run? Then I will explore the properties of semi-autonomous non-capacity generating demand components. And I will finish by comments and concluding remarks. So, as you probably know, uh, the principle of effective demand uh, has been studied in the short run first, and it is a, a principle 
who says that uh, firms uh, produce depending on aggregate demand. So uh, if the production is Y and we, we aggregate demand can be decomposed, decom decomposed in many components, for instance, uh, uh, induced consumption, C, um, induced meaning that it depends, the, the level of, of consumption directly depends on the level of the aggregate income. Investment is assumed to be the only one, the only capacity generating autonomous component. And the, usually there are several non-capacity generating uh, component, autonomous demand component. For instance, <coughs> uh, public uh, expenditure, G, X, export, credit finance consumption, residential investment, or essential goods. Something as uh, autonomous consumption of households. And as you probably know, to uh, any exogenous shock to an autonomous demand component generates a multiplier effect be because uh, the induced consumption adjusts to the level of income. So if there is a shock on investment, it generates a shock on uh, production, aggregate income, which generates a circular, circular flow of income through uh, induced consumption. <laughs> Likewise, if there is a shock uh, to uh, another, uh, to a non-capacity uh, generating uh, autonomous uh, component, Z, it generates a, a shock on production, aggregate income, and then a circular flow of uh, consumption, which explains the multiplier effect. Usually, the stock of capital is assumed to be exogenous in the short run, and uh, the factor of production are assumed to be uh, complementary rather than substitute, substitutable. Uh, so, uh, the level of production is given by the level of employment and by the level of the rate of capacity utilization u okay so that if there is an, uh, so that uh, the firms response to an increase in the aggregate demand by increasing both employment and the rate of capacity utilization of their capital stock okay Provided, of course, that the system is not subject to supply constraints. So we assume that the level of employment is lower than, than full employment. And we also assume that the rate of capacity utilization is lower than one. So now I, uh, I propose a brief presentation of no Kaleskian growth models, which are models uh, where consumption is assumed to depend on both the functional income distribution, the distribution of income between wages and profits. And we also assume usually that saving out of wages is lower than saving out of profits and that is for consumption and invest investment or rather the rate of capital accumulation g depends on gamma which is the uh, economic the economic rate of growth expected by firms by entrepreneurs and u n which is the value of the rate of capacity utilization that is assumed to be normal for entrepreneurs. And the, the main outcomes 
of this class of model is that uh, the rate of capacity utilization begin uh, endogenous. Anything that boosts the aggregate demand uh, involve an increase in the equilibrate rate of capacity utilization here. Also, uh, the economic growth and capital accumulation uh, depends on uh, animal spirits. Uh, gamma, uh, the, the entrepreneurs' expectations uh, uh, are synonymous of, uh, with uh, animal spirits. Economic growth also depends on functional income distribution. And it can depend on other parameters influencing the level of uh, the equilibrium rate uh, U. For instance, tax rates, the rate of public spending, etc. Just I add just uh, the, the, the following remarks, that, which is that the non capacity, the other non capacity uh, generating demand components, Z, are no longer autonomous in this class of model, they become uh, induced. Uh, uh, for instance, public spending is uh, considered as some weight of aggregate income or some, yeah. so it, it, it becomes uh, induced. Two main criticisms have been addressed to neo kaleskian models. The first one is that at equilibrium, which is supposed to be the long run, the rate of capacity utilization differs from what is considered to be normal by firms, which is a bit uh, strange. And uh, this other result is also strange because firms continue to expect, to expect a rate of growth of uh, output while they observe that the rate of growth of the economy is uh, different. What they observe is gamma? They, no, no, they, they observe G star and gamma is their expectation. So, uh, the main criticisms are that this equilibrium can hardly be a steady state uh, equi equilibrium because firms are expected to uh, adjust their behavior. Intuitively, entrepreneur firms may engage in a Harrodian behavior. Uh, by adjusting the value of their expectation. For instance, if they observe a growth rate which is higher than what they expect, intuitively, uh, we expect that they will increase the expectation. Okay? They will adjust uh, the expectation. It is uh, the signification of this uh, behavioral function here. However, what happens if we, if we include this uh, behavior in the neo kaleskian model? Uh, assume that uh, we observe at what time uh, in, in one period that the rate of capacity utilization is higher than the normal level, then the rate of growth is higher than what is expected by firms. So they, revert, they adjust their expectation upward, which boosts aggregate demand production and then the rate of capacity utilization. Then the discrepancy between the expectation and what they observe has increased. So they uh, boost again 
the gamma, and we uh, have something which is explosive, which, which is uh, unstable. This is the knife edge Haudian instability. Among the theoretical remedies that have been proposed in the literature to, to solve the, the problem, I, I will go very quickly here, but the Cambridge, Cambridgean model suggests that price and profit share can adjust endogeneously. The neo-Hardian neo approach uh, of Peter Scott, for instance, assumes that there is no uh, steady state or the rate of growth of the economy does not converge toward a steady step, a steady state. Uh, on the contrary, uh, there is the model is subject to knife edge instability. So there are fluctuations, but fluctuations are uh, enclosed into a corridor of stability. neo kaleskian of course, neo kaleskian uh, colleagues have proposed some mechanism to defend their model. Uh, a first argument had, has been to assume that firms have multi, multiple mutually exclusive targets, so they don't reach each target at every period. And uh, another possibility is to uh, assume that there is an hysteresis effect so that it is the normal rate of capacity utilization, which is assumed to converge toward, toward the observed or the equilibrium rate of capacity utilization. And uh, this is the kind of work uh, that uh, propose uh, Danny Lang, for instance. So I think that it is interesting to start the presentation of super multiplier models here because they are partly an answer to the problem I just uh, present in the previous slide. Uh, so these uh, super multiplier models offer an alternative remedy to uh, the problem uh, I exposed before. And uh, super multiplayer model, what we call super multiplayer models, in fact, is a combination of super multiplayer model effect, of, of two effects. First, super multiplayer model effect. And second, the Howardian behavior of firms that I have uh, presented uh, before. So, what is a super multiplayer effect? There are just those uh, super multiplayer models that are considered to be with neo Kalekian or? No, uh, well, no. Super multiple. Uh, we have two classes of super multiplayer models, which depend on the way uh, the investment behavior is specified. And there is a neo kaleskian class of super multiplayer model, which is what uh, I am going to present. And there is a Strafian uh, class of model, which rests on another specification of. Of investment. So uh, the, the, the main mechanism uh, underlying the super multiplier effect are that uh, if there is a shock on the uh, on the the autonomous uh, the non capacity generating autonomous component, if there is a shock of, on the uh, the result in a, a shock on aggregate income and then uh, both consumption and investment be are induced. So investment become an induced uh, uh, component in uh, this uh, framework. As a result, uh, economic growth is now driven by uh, Z. So that the rate of growth of the economy converges towards the rate of growth of non-capacity generating autonomous components. But this effect does not provide a solution to the problem uh, 
uh, I, I stress before. I, I focus on before. So what I proposed in my first paper on the topics uh, a few years ago was to combine the super multiplier effect with uh, this effect, with this assumption that firms adopt a Harrodian uh, behavior. And what I showed in this article is that the combination of this destabilizing effect with this effect, which is very stabilizing, can uh, provide a solution. That is, the rate of growth, the rate of capacity utilization now can converge towards its normal value. And the firm's expectation can converge towards uh, what is observed. So there, there are not, no uh, discrepancy between uh, the two kinds of parameters. Uh, just, uh, uh, I, I like figures. I think that it, it allows to, to see very quickly what, what is in, what is at stake. So assume that the, the blue line here is the initial steady state. And assume that the rate of capacity utilization is equal to its normal value. And if, if we assume, for instance, that profit share decreases durably uh, after one date, then the, what, what is expected uh, in the neo kaleskian model is that both uh, is that the production will uh, increase with a lower rate here, and that both the, we will have the, these uh, differences here. Now, if we put the same assumption, this is the same shock in a super multiplier model, what will happen is in red. So we will have uh, the, the rate of growth of the economy will slow down, but this uh, will be only transient because after a while, the rate of growth will uh, converge to its initial rate, which is the rate of growth of the autonomous component. Okay. And uh, when the economy reaches its uh, final uh, steady state, time. this is time, this is time. And uh, yes, in, in the final steady state, both the rate of capacity utilization is, is equal to its normal value and uh, the, the, the firms does not make a wrong expectation. So what about the autonomous components that have been proposed in the literature? There are many candidates. Uh, I proposed, but other proposed two uh, public uh, expenditures. Uh, Freitas and Serrano, who are Strafian economists, propose uh, credit finance consumption. Uh, Fibiger and Marc Lavoie uh, propose private resi residential investment. Uh, we have also capitalist consumption. I wrote two articles proposing that uh, Z would be essential consumer goods. And my article also uh, deals with uh, or tackles the, the, the other Arodian instability uh, problems. Of course, we may have export or consumption out of wealth. So 
this kind of uh, model are, uh, are rich models. There is a rich literature, a, re a rich young literature. There are a lot of candidates. This is something good, but this is also something that uh, weaknesses the framework. So I'm now I, I'm going to try to answer the question: Can non-capacity generating domain components be autonomous in the long run? And uh, of course, I, I will try to answer some questions that have been addressed by uh, some colleagues, as uh, Nikailis Nikiforos or Peter Scott. Uh, who says that in the long run, it is unlikely that autonomous expenditure is really autonomous, or to be autonomous, a component of demand must be exogenous. And the usual pragmatic uh, response is that in the long run, there is no truly exogenous variable, and autonomous need not mean exogenous or constant. So uh, those are pragmatic responses, but maybe too pragmatic and it is not very clear at the end what are uh, autonomous components so my opinion my view is that uh, a more deep analysis uh, is needed and it is needed especially because the number of potential candidates to the role of uh, autonomous and capacity generating demand in other way, or otherwise speaking, uh, it is clear, I, I will show uh, that in the next slide, it is clear that two autonomous components cannot grow indefinitely at, diff at different paces, it's clear. However, but if they grow, uh, if there is something if there is a link between the two or more autonomous components, well, can we say that they are autonomous or, or do they begin uh, to be endogenous or induced? So it is, yes. So the question is, is it possible for two components to be autonomous while having the same growth rate? So it is. it was the main purpose of my article. The structure of the model is the following. It is very simple supermultiplier model. Uh, where the autonomous component is split into two components, Z1 and Z2. Consumption is uh, only depends on uh, propensity to save S and, and, of course, aggregate income. And I have the previous uh, behavior concerning investment. Z1 is as gross at the rate G1, Z2 grows at the rate G2. And in my article, I did not specify what are these uh, autonomous components. I did not specify Z1 is public expenditure or export or something else, just to focus on some logical or conceptual uh, discussion. This model, in any case, the level of is, uh, it, it, so it, it is not totally induced in the short run because it depends on gamma, okay. but gamma adjusts in the long run, adjusts in the long run, so it becomes induced. Okay. Hmm. So because I did not specify the components. Of course, there are drawbacks in the model. But it is too simplified to address many questions, such as uh, financial dynamics for, for the two autonomous components here. So I assume that the initial situation is uh, the steady state. And I propose some comparative dynamics uh, following a permanent shock to either G1 or G2. And the underlying question 
is whether uh, autonomous is synonymous of uh, exogenous or whether induced is synonymous of endogenous. So I, I, have, I, I will show a few very simple simulations, not calibrated, it's not the, the, the aim of the, the purpose of, of the model. Uh, the initial steady state is here. So the gross rate for all aggregate is assumed to be uh, 0 0.03. Okay, and it is assumed that G1 increases to 0 0.04 and remains equal to 0 0.04. And we just watch or look at what uh, happens now. And what happens is that, um, so the straight line is, is GZ which is the, average, the weighted average of Z1 and Z2. So, and here we have uh, the gross rate of output and the gross rate of the capital stock. And what appears clearly is that, of course, all aggregates are attracted to G1 except Z2, which uh, continues to grow at the same rate as before, which is 0 0.03. And at last, of course, Z2 uh, vanishes because it begins uh, very small uh, compared to the increase of the economy. So, uh, it is a way to answer to the previous question, uh, no, two autonomous components cannot increase at different exogenous rate because at the end, those who grows with the lower rate will disappear. That raises many questions. Uh, for instance, is there one true autonomous domain component in the long run? The other one becoming induced. So in, a clarification uh, is needed. It is why it is what I am going to explore now. J'ai mis un chronomètre, mais j'ai oublié de le dire. D'accord. Okay. So, what are the properties of uh, semi-autonomous non-capacity non generating demand components? Uh, here, a dose of pragmatism is required. Uh, I also propose to uh, adopt uh, the uh, ex uh, expression provide, uh, proposed by Fibiger and Lavoie, as they say that uh, obviously no one believes that, the, uh, uh, no, as they say that the prefix of semi is found is Kaleski and it, is, it seems to be preferable. Obviously, no one believes that the growth rate of the semi autonomous expenditure will be a constant value in the real world, even on average. So, at last, there will be a distinction between induced components, which are components that more or less directly depend on the level of the aggregate income, and uh, semi-autonomous components, which can be the result of discretionary decisions, decisions at least uh, over the period. The period which can be also, uh, which the result of a relative flexibility of financial conditions, at least over the period or for the horizon. So we, we will have this distinction between induced components and semi-autonomous components. So 
So, um, I propose another simulation with, uh, in, start, starting from the previous one. So, the, the initial steady state is 0 0.03. G1 increases to 0 0.05. For instance, there is a fiscal stimulus. So, uh, government decided to increase the rate of growth of public expenditure or banks decision banks can decide to facilitate access to credit uh, to to the other holds for instance but however what happens here is that because the rate of growth of z1 is higher than the rate of growth of the aggregate income here uh, financial constraints arise uh, to, to finance Z1. So the idea, I, I did not model it because Z1 is not specified, but we can expect some financial constraints on Z1. And then after a while, uh, G1 must converge back to GY. All, and all aggregates will converge back to G2. And at last, in this picture, Z2, Z2 remains the only autonomous component in the long run, unless Z2 is in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, sorry affected by the transient improvement in economic conditions. So I will propose another uh, issue to this uh, situation, which will be scenario C. And it's in, in scenario C, as before, G1 increases, but depending on uh, what is the autonomous component Z2? What, what happens? Because of the increase of G1, the rate of growth of the economy increases. And now Z2 is very easy, is more easy to finance. So uh, we can imagine that uh, the people or the agents that uh, control Z2 will. Uh, accept to increase the rate of growth of Z2. Yeah. Do you have to show the same way in this scenario? Uh, G2 is increasing while in the previous one, scenario B, G2 is stable. <laughs> here, here, I assume that Z2 is stable and that Z1 uh, faces some financial constraint with uh, make it necessary to decrease uh, G1. And here, what I assume that is that, uh, of course, G1 faces some financial uh, problems, but in, in, meanwhile, uh, Z2 faces financial ease. So, uh, so it, it can be a convergence uh, through an increase in G2. But here, I, I, I come back. So, here, the conclusion here is that in this situation, Z2 is the only autonomous component in the long run. In this situation, Z1 is the only, only autonomous component in the long run. But uh, also, uh, uh, it is possible to, of course, imagine a mix of the two scenarios which can take this form here, assuming that uh, when uh, the agent that control Z1 decide to decrease Z1 because of uh, financial constraints, the agents that control Z2 accept to increase G2 because uh, it is more easy to finance. Uh, so. And uh, 
this is why at last uh, Z1 and Z2 are no longer autonomous. They are not totally induced, but they have a status which is a, something. I, I, I'm not very, uh, it is not very easy for me to explain that because it is not totally uh, Cartesian. It is not totally, we, we, we prefer things that are very ac accurately defined. So here it is a bit pragmatic, a bit unsatisfying, but I think that maybe uh, the re real world works uh, in, in this line. And of course, we can imagine many variants of scenario D. So I arrive to my concluding remarks. Uh, just uh, I go back uh, to the semi autonomous non capacity uh, generating demand components. So the idea is that concerning public, public expenditure. The idea is that it can be discretionary on uh, sub-periods, so that the uh, government may choose at some time to uh, adjust its growth, its growth rate to the growth rate of the economy, but it can decide over some sub-periods to uh, a fiscal stimulus or fiscal austerity. Um, Many post keynesians say that uh, uh, resident, residential investment in the US have been uh, strong drivers of the economy uh, a few decades ago. And the idea was that, uh, of course, maybe banks have uh, developed credit offer depending on demographics and financial innovation. So it is possible over some periods to uh, propose a rate of growth of credit or rate of growth of private uh, investment, residential investment that is higher than GY. Exports. Exports is maybe more problematic because it is usually considered as uh, it is usually considered to be exogenous or autonomous, but uh, this consideration is based on a partial analysis. In a general equilibrium, not a Valrassian equilibrium, but in a general uh, macroeconomic equilibrium, uh, the rate of growth abroad cannot be assumed to be exogenous. And the reverse dependence uh, Oh, I, I think that uh, maybe, but, but the reverse dependence of the growth rate of uh, abroad on the growth rate, uh, domestic rate must be specified. And th there is a mechanism that has been proposed by Caldorian economists here that can also explain what, why, uh, export could be considered as semi-autonomous component in the long run. It is the export-led cumulative causation, which uh, assumes that an increase in economic growth gen generates technical progress, then an increase in competitiveness, and then an increase in export. So exports can is not totally exogenous. Uh, essential consumer goods, uh, the, the idea underlying this uh, component as a, a semi-autonomous component is the following. It is that uh, an increase in population means that there are more mooses to feed and bodies to shelter. So the growth rate of uh, essential goods is equal to the growth rate of the population. But uh, primary, primary needs rest on a sociological foundation. So the growth rate of essential goods depend on 
and, and it, it also depends on the gain on labor productivity. So also uh, essential uh, consumer goods can be considered as semi-autonomous in the long run. Uh, another command is that, of course, I, I, I said it before, uh, I think that dealing with the long run, we should have a certain dose of pragmatism uh, because uh, yes, because semi-autonomous components can become partially dependent from each other in the long run. So this results in something that it, it, it's some kind of past dependency in the model. And I, I provide a, a small example ici, here. And uh, so the underlying intuition is that uh, in the real world, the status, the status of each non-capacity generating demand component can change over time. And a component can be induced over some period and it can become it can become autonomous over other sub-periods. Uh, some colleagues uh, have implemented some empiric empirical uh, studies uh, with uh, this kind of framework. And several authors construct an aggregate non-capacity generating demand component, Z, and they put uh, usually uh, public expenditure, exports, residential investment, and so on. And they generally succeed in showing that GZ causes, uh, Granger causes the growth rate of the economy other than the other way around. So it, it, it looks, it, could be uh, an argument in favor of super multiplayer models. A few studies attempt to identify which autonomous component drive up or down the economy on some superior. It is a work I have in mind a work, a work made by Freitas and Drake on Brazil uh, over. Uh, many decades in the 20th century. And of course, uh, some connection are, are possible with a comparative uh, political economy approaches. And uh, we remembering that super multiplayer model focus on the growth rate of semi-autonomous demand component, while other approach can put the focus elsewhere, for, for instance, on the on income distribution as in neo calescan model. Uh, to finish, um, I have a somewhat paradoxical and not totally satisfying for me conclusion, which is the following. Uh, according to super multiplayer models, the rate of growth of the economy converges toward the rate of growth of non-capacity uh, demand component in the long run. However, these components, none of these components are entirely exogenous or autonomous. Therefore, the long run is likely to be highly pass dependent. So that, which is maybe realistic, pragmatic, <clears throat> but, a bit frustrating on a theoretical uh, view because uh, theoretical models become poorly predictive. Uh, it is very difficult to predict what will happen if what will happen is subject to past dependency. So, 
So at last, I think my opinion is that fundamentally, the long run results from a succession of short or medium run. So uh, I am quite confident to an expression which is reminded by uh, Marc Lavoie in his uh, handbook. That is that uh, the, the long run is the result of provisional equilibria. So to finish, uh, what are the contributions of super multiplayer models? In my view, they can be seen as an extension of neo kaleskian models or other model which deals with a lower run with the idea that uh, the previous outcome of neo kaleskian model has, met, has been made consistent with the result that there is no, pro, no logical or theoretical problem in the long run because uh, the growth rate of the because the rate of capacity utilization converges toward its, its normal value. The Arodian behavior of firms have, has been introduced in the model, but it does no generate uh, knife edge instability. Super multiplayer models suggest to take into account the dynamics of uh, semi autonomous components which is a source of uh, growth, which was neglected in the neo kaleskian approach. And uh, due to past dependency, short-run dynamics play an important role in the long run. So thank you for your attention. The references are, thank you. The references are in the paper except this one uh, that I put here. Okay, thank you very much uh, Louis, for this uh, religion presentation. I think uh, we are, I have a much better view of the uh, development by the uh, model. So we have two questions, right? So uh, one ahead. Um, um, D'accord, d'accord. D'accord, donc. Can you hold it? Can you hold it, please? Oh, non. Alors, donc, c'est le partage, c'est le vert. Oui, c'est le vert. Et en grand maintenant? Parce que j'en ai en grand. Hein? En, en grand. Comme ça. Euh, une web, plein écran. Ah, d'accord. Le zoom. Voilà, ok. C'est bon. Attends, je regarde là-bas. Branche-toi avec ça. Parce que t'en as un L'adaptateur.
Donc là, euh, en droit, tu as une connexion Non, non, je te viens. Je présente ça Oui. De rien. Okay. Uh, 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 Yeah. Okay, I'm speaking slowly. Okay, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, 
Uh, okay, so perhaps you could like stand there for long so long. Okay. No, no, I mean, no. it doesn't matter. Even if it's shorter, they know that there was a third part that was supposed yeah. to be, and so it's kind of shorter. Um, okay. uh, Please now we have the discussion. So finally, the discussion will remain only by uh, Ace Data and Norma. So, you can do uh, Hello, everyone. I am Mohammed, and with Aisha, we will present Professor uh, Alan paper, a super multiplier model with two non capacity generating semi autonomous demand components. A lot of big words, but we will try to, to make it accessible even the professor has done much of the work. Uh, first of all, we want to thank Professor Alan for coming and sharing his work with us and for Professor Flasher and Reberio for organizing the seminars. So first, uh, there is this uh, statistician called Box that created many models. And he said that all, all models are wrong and some are are useful in economics most models are wrong and some are useful and the the model of the super multiplier and the underlying models are very useful indeed and many of them are correct so i i will start with a brief introduction to the basics of these models so the first model appear with the Keynesian multiplier, which basically me measures the effect of changes in aggregate supply. So uh, if, if we, for instance, look at this graph, th this graph provides us with many useful information. For instance, if we look at the two lines, AD1 and AD2, we see that they, they are parallel. And we see that the only difference is G. In this model here, we consider that government spending is exogenous, is autonomous. And doing this basically allows us to understand the effects and the positive effect of government spending. For instance, if we increase government spending, what will be the net effect? And these kind of models help policymakers assess the nature of their policies. And we did notice that in the aftermath of the crisis of 2008, there was an outcry, there was a need for government to, to in, invest more. And at that time, many economists found that the multiplier was, was very high. We see also that many of the, we see that this Keynesian multiplier is a short term model, basically because the multiplier is zero in the long run. So there is, there is no need for it to, to be a, oh, and it is also a capacity generating model. And even this Keynesian multiplier extends far from the fiscal policy framework. For, for instance, we, we see it in the monetary policy and central banking, where in the frac fractional reserve banking, 
such the one that we have. We have the, mon the money multiplier, which basically measures the, the effect of monetary changes because when banks receive deposits, they loan those deposits. And then basically that th those deposits are deposited at another bank, which then loans and so on and so forth. We have also the multiplier accelerator model which was introduced by Samuelson in 1936, which is also in a further extension of the Keynesian multiplier. So we see that the Keynesian multiplier is a very basic model, yet it's very useful. Going, going forward, we see that we have, we have the, the title of the super multiplier. And the, the economist that introduced this model was John Hicks, in his book uh, on, on trade theory. And he talked about the model in one page and he finished the page saying, okay, we stop here. We are no longer talking about super, super multiplier, but other people picked up the work. And he did introduce many other concepts in that book. For instance, he introduced the term of autonomous investment that the professor explained. And we see that he used the autonomous investment term to to, to define the super multiplier. And even though his model is capacity generating, the, capa the autonomous investment part is, does not play any role in super multiplier because it is caused by, by autonomous consumption. And so before going to the Serafian multiplier, the professor did speak about the role of Harrodian instability, but it is, it is it is an important bridge bet between the Higgs, the Higgs super multiplier and the Serafian multiplier. And basically, Harrod posits that the investment demand adjusts in the long run to the normal capacity utilization rate because for, for him, growth is internal. And growth here, uh, he advances the natural growth, but also the warranted growth, and then depending on how those mechanisms interact, we have di different scenarios and different scenarios have different macroeconomic ex explanation that also re relate to capacity utilization. For him, we see that there is a paradox that the professor has cited also between the role of the savings rate in the short term and the long term, because, because it's positive, it's, it, it drives the growth, but only the short term, and it diminishes growth in the, in the long term. And so this, this leads us to, to the Serafian multiplier, which was introduced by Serrano, which is a, a Brazilian e economist. And uh, this also ex partly explains how these models are very, why these models are very popular in Brazil and Latin America in general. And, and he uses basically the the Serafian concept and then he uses the super multiplier but then he writes that this model was not I mean he just confirms and insists that his model was not introduced by Srafa and that he's building on Srafa's work based on interpretations of Srafa's work for instance by Garignani and other economists and so the central point Basically, the central point of this model is that there is a constant uh, adjustment of the propensity to save to, to autonomous consumption. Uh, also, I, I want also to add a point on, on the utility of these models, because these are not only big words, but these, these models bring two important concepts that, that everyone here could agree with. And the first is that they help us analyze the long term. And they, and they help us understand the, the effects of shocks to the economy. So for instance, if we look at the climate emergency, it is a long-term problem and the solution needs to be long-term and the problems also will appear incrementally over time. But also the problem will be accompanied with many shocks that will affect the economy to its core. So the ability to build these models that will also give us the ability to, to maneuver mathematically because we have tools to build them is very useful for people that want to understand the climate emergency and participate in solving it. Now I will pass, uh, pass the floor to Aisha to 
expound more on the Serafian uh, supermultiplier. Okay, thank you, Mohamed, for giving us a little background um, on this model. So to sum up again, the supermultiplier model with two non-capacity generating semi-autonomous demand components in its most simple form. Um, it is a model that aims to uh, analyze the interactions between different components of aggregate demand, such as consumption, investment, uh, government expenditure, net exports. And in this model, um, capacity utilization and capital accumulation play a determining uh, important role in determining uh, the level of aggregate demand as well as economic growth. And also conversely, the growth rate of each of these autonomous demand components as well as the uh, propensity to save also play um, an important role on uh, or impact the capacity utilization and uh, uh, capital accumulation individually in different ways. And one thing that the model also suggests is that if the semi-autonomous demand components are growing at different rates, and the long-term growth of the economy will be determined by uh, whichever autonomous component um, has the highest growth rate. So there's kind of a pull factor um, happening there. Okay, so uh, how does this specific uh, supermultiplier model contribute to the literature? of uh, super multipliers. Well, there are several ways it um, contributes. I'm just gonna focus on three today, on three points that I want to highlight, uh, which is first, it expands, it's also what the professor already said, it, it expands upon the traditional supplier models by uh, incorporating multiple demand components, whereas previous super multiplier models only um, usually um, focused on one single component. And so therefore this model um, allows for more detailed analysis uh, of the interaction between different sources of expenditure. And then secondly, and this is also important, is that it considers the potential indigeneity of autonomous demand components um, compared to previous uh, models where they were usually uh, regarded as being exogenous or some components were regarded as being exogenous. What does that mean concretely? That means that the growth rates of each of the uh, autonomous demand components, such as government expenditure or exports, for example, are determined by factors that are internal to the model, meaning uh, related to, for example, income. And therefore, that captures the feedback effect that exists between, for example, high expenditure, uh, higher income and higher expenditures. And this is also connected to the third point that I wanted to highlight here, is that an incorporates, so this model incorporates Verdon's law, which states that an increase in income um, can lead to technical progress and an increase or an improvement in competitiveness, which in turn can boost ex um, exports and aggregate supply. <clears throat> so, what I, however, what I wanted to come back to is how this model um, determines the rate of capital accumulation. In this model, capacity utilization is defined as the ratio between actual output to potential output or the maximum output that can be produced with a existing uh, level of capital stock um, or labor force. And so uh, capital accumulation is assumed to be determined um, by capacity utilization in such a way that higher capacity utilization leads to higher capital accumulation and vice versa. And this assumption is based on the idea that firms will invest in new capital stock um, um, when they are operating at full or at near capacity, as this will allow them to increase their production uh, as well as meet the demand uh, for their products. However, there are also other uh, factors that could potentially impact um, capital accumulation. I'm thinking here about uh, availability of credit, um, technological change, or uh, changes in the cost of capital. And from there stems my first discussion question to you, Professor, uh, given that the long run equilibrium is given when the uh, rate of capital accumulation is equal to the rate of, uh, to the capacity, rate of capacity utilization. Um, how do factors such as availability of credit, technological change, and changes in the cost of capital potentially affect the long run equilibrium of the model? Um, I will first uh, discuss all my questions and then at the end we will hopefully get an answer. So a second point that I wanted to discuss here is how uh, the model assumes that the propensity to save remains constant over time. 
although we do understand that this is an assumption that is often made in macroeconomic models as a simplifying assumption, in reality, the propensity to save might vary to a number of factors. And here I'm thinking about changes in household income or changes in wealth, as well as changes in expectations about the future. Um, so that means that the propensity to save might not always be constant, and this can be uh, especially true in developing countries. And so therefore, my second discussion question to you is, how can the model handle variations in the propensity to save over time? And how might this impact the results of the model? And then finally, and this is uh, closely connected to the point that I just made, is that um, we do recognize that this is obviously a fiscal policy model. Uh, I, however, wanted to still bring the issue of monetary policy into the model because monetary policy can also have a level on aggregate demand. Um, for example, the central bank uh, can use its um, tools such as interest rates to increase or decrease the uh, level of money supply um, in the economy, and this can have um, an impact on the level of aggregate demand components through changes in the credit availability, or alternatively, the central bank can um, also, the monetary policy can also um, influence the economic growth through um, effects on expectations about future economic conditions. For example, if the central bank were to uh, signal that they would remain uh, maintain low interest rates in the future, then um, this could encourage households and firms to increase their spending because they might expect that in the future uh, borrowing would remain cheap. Or conversely, if uh, the central bank were to signal to a tight monetary policy in the future, then this could also lead um, to expectations of firms and households reducing their spending. So uh, therefore, um, by ignoring um, monetary policy, the model might not fully um, um, capture the effect uh, of changes um, in the availability of credit and expectations about aggregate demand and economic growth. So the final question that I have would be how might incorporating monetary policy change the results of the model? Okay, I'm going back to you. Is there all? No. It's here. Yeah, it's all of the questions. The third part, yeah. Okay, the presentation is finished. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, I think I. So I don't know, maybe Olivier. Yeah, okay. Maybe Olivier can start answering those I three or four questions. Do you hear me? Okay. And then I, I will questions. start by to by my answer to the second question, which which is the most easiest, the most easy. Uh, no, it, it it will be it. It would be very easy to make uh, the propensity to save depend on uh, income distribution or the behavior of capitalists or workers. So if it is what you uh, hear by uh, endogenous propensity to save or variations in propensity to save, I think that it is not a problem. I did not want to put too much uh, assumption in the model just to focus on what was uh, the, the question I wanted to address. Okay, so I, I think that th there is no problem to assume that the propensity to save uh, depends on uh, income distribution between wages and, and profit. Okay. Um, how might uh, incorporating monetary policy change in the results of the model. I uh, really I don't know. I did not uh, address the the question before. Um, I, well, I, I 
some uh, Freitas and Saranos, Raffian super uh, multiplayer uh, economists, suggest that uh, credit finance uh, consumption uh, could be a great candidate to uh, the role of uh, semi-autonomous uh, demand component. So credit, uh, so I, I think that of course, among the, um, uh, um, among the, um, of, uh, in, in the specification of the behavior of credit uh, financing consumption, credit offered by banks, uh, there is the policy of the central bank. So the policy of the central bank can uh, have uh, an impact of this kind of autonomous demand component. However, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't see if there is some room to put a place for this kind of policy in the model elsewhere in the model. I, I don't know, I'm not sure. But if, if I'm correct, ISATA also had the idea that it might change the expectations. No. You, you mentioned expectation when dealing with monetary policy or yeah yeah so my point was um if there's any way how somehow in the model to capture the expectations uh, on aggregate demand on economic uh, growth that are real well, as I said, because if there is some past dependency, many things can happen in the long run. And uh, short run uh, shocks in the economy may have, can have a long run impact. So, but, but it, it is not as easy. For instance, if firms have a, uh, better expectations, they will increase their uh, investment, their capacity utilization, but in some times uh, they will face to a um, rate of capacity utilization, which will be uh, also in which way? The, the rate of growth is low. They, uh, yes, I think that they will face with um, rate of capacity utilization that will be lower than the normal rate of capacity utilization. And then when their expectation switches, maybe we will come back to the first steady state, to the initial steady state. So it is not quite easy what will happen because of past dependency and past dependency depends on wh what are the components that are affected by uh, the dynamics of the economic situation. Um, re regarding your first, your first questions, um, the availability of credit was part of the story I think I, I presented in my presentation. Yes. Because, uh, of course, the, the idea is if there is a component which is subject to an increase in, in, in if, which, if, if an increase in its rate of growth, then there will be some financial constraints. So, so depending on the necessity to uh, balance uh, something in finance, uh, the, the, the component will remain autonomous or not, or become induced uh, in, in some period. I don't know if I'm clear, but. So the idea is in, in this model, both uh, investment 
and the two autonomous components are financed out of saving. And if we specify accurately uh, the model, what is Z1? What are the finance sources of Z1? The same for Z2. So I think that we can explore the question of credit availability and uh, uh, finance constraint on this. Yes. Uh, I, I just want to. Uh, I just want to add to what uh, Aisha said and to also what you said, Lacey, Because if we try to look more economically at it, we can see that in these last 10, 20 years, firm finance most of their investment through savings or what they call retained earnings. So it is it is just an idea, but if firms use retained earnings to finance their investment and specifically in the, in the last decade where dividends were really low because firms retained most of their capital, we can see that the interest rate could could basically act is act as a measure of the opportunity cost. For instance, if the interest rate is high, firms will not retain as much capital as they would have done if the interest rate was low. And so, I think that there is there a correlation between mm -hmm. these two. Maybe. Yes. Yes. Just. Uh... Technological change, it was uh, included in my previous paper. Uh, so I think that we, and it is important because there is a drawback in the world discussion today, which is uh, it is always assumed that the, the model does not uh, bump in, or does not hurt supply constraint and uh, first it is a drawback and the second drawback is that in the long run it is something that we observe in the long run the rate of growth of the economy is equal to the natural rate of growth so we have to uh, establish the, the consistency between the, the two growth the two rate of growth and the cost of capital, I, that, I don't know. But I, I would have to start by thank you for your presentation, which, which was brilliant. And thank you also, uh, Aisata and Mohamed, for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, Hello, thank you. For, Okay. Hmm? Oui, oui. C'est vrai. Je So hello, thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Uh, I have a doubt about just the concept in itself of the uh, semi-autonomous component, because I feel like it's the same criticizing with the A in the solo model. They say that the economists say that in the A in solo model is technological change, and actually just a bunch of everything. Since they are not able to explain what is this A, they just say okay, it's technological change, and suddenly it sticks to reality. You make the model stick to the reality. And I feel like it's the same things with these components. Then uh, since we are unable to know precisely what are the real explanations for growth, then you just add uh, all these components and then you make stick your model to the reality. So uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm saying something wrong, but I, I have yes, this question about the I, concept in itself. Je, je réponds tout de suite. Uh, no, it's not wrong, uh, but I, I think that my process is not the same than in solo model because in some way, my purpose is not to explain uh, economic growth in the long run. In some way, my purpose is to 
answer to, to response to a problem which was addressed to Neocalescan models. And Neocalescan models appear to be uh, rather or quite uh, re relevant in some medium or, or long run, but the problem of the discrepancy between what expect firms and what they observe. So the, I think that my model uh, re-established the consistency between uh, or, or, or of the neo calescan model. Well, and as I said in my presentation, at the end, I am not sure about what are the engine of economic growth. Is it uh, the growth rate of autonomous components? It, is it uh, income distribution? Is it? I think that it is partly unsatisfying because I think that if you if you arrive to the answer that there is past dependency, so uh, there are a lot of uh, ex possible explanation to economic growth when you yes so i don't think that i enclose the answer in one uh, in one only cause i think that the problem is perhaps the opposite it is to open to 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 wide uh, the, the answer okay um, okay, thank you very much, Professor, for the presentation and also for my colleagues. Um, so I have a few short questions. First, I wanted to ask your personal opinion, um, how you see the super multiplier um, uh, compatibility with the Caldorian uh, line of thought, because I see the mechanism very similar and the Caldorian saying export is what drives growth uh, and the super multiplier adding other things to it. So what's your opinion on that? And then... Um, I think also related to this, in that in that paper you presented from Freitas and Dweck, um, and also in other papers from the theory of law uh, literature, like Macombi and so on, mm -hmm. they do this debate that all the economies are either export constrained or um, policy constrained. And I think this somehow would also mean there is a relationship between exports and public expenditure and monetary policy that makes the, the growth rates converge. So if you if you have seen this literature, if you think that is related to this relationship of autonomous components that you're discussing. And then one last question. Uh, so if we're looking at different components like government expenditure and exports and and credit consumption and so on, at the long run, we with like your paper is doing a logical experiment, right? But in the end, you say in the short run, the medium run, you have many things that are varying. So in terms of empirical work, do you think it is, um, it is possible to do empirical work testing the, these premises that you're, that you're showing here for short and medium run, or, or do you think it's, they're not? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, about uh, Calderian models, uh, I think that the, the, there is a recent uh, article by Guillermo Morlin, Morlin in, in structural change and economic dynamics. And he, he combines uh, uh, ex export components based on uh, several uh, hy hypotheses and uh, public spending. But in, in his model, public spending at last is uh, always induced by the income. So he, 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 he think he proposed a model with two autonomous components, but uh, there is only one, which is export. So it, uh, um, so two to, to, to points. The first one is it is what Blake, Blaker and Setterfield say. It is okay. Super multiplier model is, is another way to rewrite 
Sirois low and uh, export clip model, uh, Calderian models, etc. And it is, and of course, there is not very far, the, the, the two class of our model are, are not very far, far from each other. But, so I think that we are in the same family of models. Okay. But I'm, I'm never satisfied when someone says to me that uh, the only uh, exogenous or autonomous component in the long run is export because it is a way to not to answer the question because uh, why it is export because because of the rate of growth abroad but what does explain the rate of growth abroad you have to so it is a partial analysis it is why i think that um i i, I did not uh, uh, look too much at uh, this kind of model. I don't remind your second question. Sorry. The differentiation between um, export constraint or, or policy constraint ah, yes. in the literature? No, I think that uh, at last, what will be useful with this kind of super multiplier models, and maybe with uh, after my discussion, will be to implement uh, empirical uh, analysis in order to distinguish the fact that in some times in 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 this country uh, growth is driven by policy and in other time it is driven by exports and it is what do uh, freitas and drake okay so i think that it it, it will be very interesting to 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 implement uh, this kind of, of studies and about uh, empirical analysis i uh, mentioned that some colleagues put uh, many uh, autonomous components in one component and they test the grandeur the, the grandeur test the causality i'm not quite sure that it is a uh, uh, relevant test to the to the theory. I'm not sure. I, I have some uh, uh, doubt. Uh, it's a bit confused in my mind, so I don't give. I don't explain my doubt. I, I think that it is very difficult to test uh, because it is difficult to write the the other the other to, to test against what yes and so it is it is quite difficult okay thank you for your question yeah i wanted to ask a question about uh, if there is a um, european multiplier calculated by by uh, in the research and if not if it's possible to calibrate such a model uh, or at least find the uh, parameters or calibrate parameters such as propensity to say propensity to see if, if it's possible to do it with reasonable uh, hypothesis in order to see the effect of potential shocks, fiscal, fiscal shocks, for instance, on, on the economy? Um, well, I, I think that today there is no uh, calibrate uh, mo uh, super multiplayer model today. But I think that Freitas and uh, Serrano and the colleagues in Brazil are working or on some calibration on stock flow consistent and calibrated models. So um i'm not sure that they made their calibration on european economics but uh, i think that it is something that is in the air but it, it will be interesting okay thank you um thank you professor uh thank you also aisha and mohammed um so it's a very uh, kind of simple question but I had the feeling that more than this, I mean, also describing the long run growth, but I feel that these models also try to deal with like problems that are appeared in the literature during the years, like uh, Harrogen stability or like um, how to extend the the uh, the, the principle of of, um, of the demand of Keynes for the long run. And I feel that they try to answer these things by looking at by creating these models. and. 
at the end, obviously, you came to the Kazertan Chica article to say, okay, maybe these models are not so are not the best thing that we should be doing. But do you think at the end that they solve these problems that we find? For example, do you think at the end we can say, okay, we understand that Harrodon instability actually doesn't happen because of the super multiplier and the, the external markets? Or do you think there is still these these things are still there? Or or even like Marxist uh, view that like okay profits what's guiding things do you think that these answers are solved with this um, super multiplier models or I think this is also already op still open well uh, simple question so add, add, had an uh, answer of course uh, <laughs> um, in my view um, so I, I work on super multiplier model for around 10 years. And maybe today I am more skeptical about <laughs> what can be done. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> With this kind of model. I think that, for instance, Brazilian colleagues uh, as uh, Fabio Freitas and, and so on, uh, they are very um, motivated to uh, to improve this class of model and to show that uh, the the reality uh, behave as the model and so on. My opinion, and if you speak with Marc Lavoie, I think that we share the, the same opinion. Is that maybe that one of the outcome of uh, my work, my previous works, is to have answer the question of the long run problems of the neo kaleskian model. And when you, and at this stage, you have, I think, two possibility. Either you continue working on, on super multiplayer model because you think that it provides a good understanding on the long run. Or you can say that, okay, the long run is very past dependent. So I will put the focus on short and medium run, uh, short and medium run uh, topics. I think that it, it answers the questions. And, <laughs> and yeah, uh, that's one. Thank you, Professor, and my colleagues. Um, I was wondering, you know, this is related to my master thesis. When you were explaining that for you exports in this model can be semi-autonomous -auto or can be at some point endogenous, do you think like remittances for developing countries specifically could also follow this logic? Because like in this sense, like they, there's not only a, an economical like relationship, but, but also a, so, a socio, sociological relationship between the people that is sending the money and to whom they're sending the money. So you think there could be there... Uh, a, an interesting like comp behavior that could be incorporated in these type of models. Yes, uh, of course, I did not have uh, think as much as, as I would have on this question before because you asked me a few weeks ago, a few months ago. So um, maybe I, I think that it is promising. So uh, yeah, you, you have to work on that. We, we are going to work on that uh, together. And, but I, I don't, uh, I, 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 am, I can't give the answer today. I, I don't know if it is uh, what will be the result of that. And um, so, in your question and what I have to think about, I, I, I don't know what at last is endogenous and what is exogenous. So what uh, it's a bit confused in my, in my mind, so I, I have to think about it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just a short, short question. Um, maybe I just understood it wrongly, but you explained that in the, the Cambridge, like in a neocolatical model, and then you said there's the solution of the Cambridge school. 
um, to get the um, like the the things right. And I was wondering if if the solution is actually that the growth rate will be the same at, as the previous um, is like then it's actually the same as in this sub super multiplier model or not like with, with the Cambridge model that like uh, in the new collection you you said that the if the u star is higher than the un then the profit share will rise mm -hmm. and therefore the savings rate will rise and therefore you have the adaptation of the u star mm -hmm. and i'm wondering does this mean that the rate of growth is actually adapting to the previous one or not um not sure because they don't use the same uh, uh, investment behavior in Cambridge uh, model. So I'm, I think that in their model, uh, the rate of capacity utilization converges toward its normal value, but I'm not sure that the rate of growth uh, converges back to its uh, former level. I, I okay. thank you. Answer. I, just a short clarification question. I'm not sure I understood uh, the reason behind uh, what we observe in the simulation in the first case you presented, in the scenario A, I think it was called, why the autonomous component growing at the lowest rate at the end disappear? Be, be, because... Uh... Be, because, it's just because of the construction of the model or be, no be, because all the aggregates in the model uh, consumption uh, induced consumption investment and z1 are growing at a rate which is uh, at last given by g1 yeah so z2 which grows at a rate which is lower continue uh, to grow, but it grow at a, a very low rate, rate. So its weight in the aggregate demand converges to zero. It, it is, uh, yeah. Okay. Is that all? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Like the problem is increasing faster and, 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 and.